Let us worship God in spirit and in truth. Be someone who cultivates a love for God's Word. It's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. what I'm sharing with you is the book of First Peter. This is part nine that we are busy with today. And this is the final message on First Peter. Can you believe it? Point number one, shepherding the flock. Please say that out aloud with me, shepherding the flock. Do you believe that the shepherding of the flock is important? It is certainly important. It is spoken about you very clearly by Peter. Now look at verse two and three, and by the way, keep your Bible open throughout the time of our sharing so that you can glance down at what I'm referring to. Look at verse two and three, just this I wanna read in the New Living Translation. It says, care for the flock that God has entrusted to you. Watch over it willingly, not grudgingly, not for what you will get out of it, but because you are eager to serve God. Don't lord it over people assigned to your care, but lead them by your good example. Now, in terms of this, I'd like to say that 
many abuses that have taken place in church circles could be totally eliminated if these two verses were just obeyed. The solution is always in the word of God. It is that powerful that these two verses being obeyed could make such a radical difference. Now, elders, talks about elders. Essentially, made simple, elders are church leaders. Elders or church leaders, do you realize that they carry a great responsibility before God for the flock? Do you realize that elders will one day answer to God for how they have conducted themselves before the people of God and leading the people of God? Do you realize that God is very serious about his sheep being well cared for? And Jesus said to Peter in John 21, he said, feed my lambs, tend my sheep, feed my sheep. So Peter must have felt like this is a bit of an overemphasis, God, but it wasn't it wasn't being overemphasized too much. You can't overemphasize it too much. And Jesus said it three times. And so here, later on, Peter is now telling us the same thing. Peter had learned through the impartation of Jesus, and now Peter is passing that on. He says, listen, this is very important that we care for the people of God, that the elders in the church care for the people of God. And in Ezekiel 34, Verse four and five, we find something very interesting, that the Lord is rebuking the unfaithful shepherds in Israel because they haven't taken up their responsibility and because they've also been harsh and wicked as shepherds. I'll read it to you, Ezekiel 34, four and five. God says to these unfaithful shepherds, you have not strengthened the weak or healed the sick or bound up the injured, You have not uh, brought back the strays or searched for the lost. You have ruled them harshly and brutally. Sounds like leaders that were like bullies. In verse five it says, so they were scattered because there was no shepherd. Do you know that the elders, the church leaders, they are supposed to be like those olden day shepherds who had literal sheep who would protect their sheep. They would guide their sheep. They would guard their sheep. And as I see it, they actually really had a love for the sheep in their care. And you know what? Today, in this day and age, now more than ever before, the church needs faithful shepherds. Do you agree with that? And it'll become increasingly necessary as persecution increases, which the Bible says will happen in an increasing way in the last days. Even much more then, faithful shepherds will be needed. Now in verse two and three, Peter touches on three characteristics that should not be present amongst church leaders and church leadership. And we need to take note of this. And the three characteristics are number one, compulsion. Number two, dishonest gain. Number three, lording it over people. May I just say a few things on those three aspects? So, these are characteristics that must not be present in church leadership. Compulsion. Everybody say compulsion. Compulsion. What is compulsion? It is reluctance. It is dragging your feet. And instead of compulsion, there should be willingness. There should be a desire to please God. The second aspect that he touches on here is dishonest gain. Please say that, dishonest gain. What is dishonest gain? It's about greed. It's about doing it for the money. It's about a church leader who says, well, what is in it for me? And that is so wrong. Instead of that, there should be eagerness to serve and there should be zeal, true zeal for the things of God. So compulsion Dishonest gain. Then there's the other aspect, lording over people. Please say that with me, lording over people. What does this mean? It talks about basically leaders or elders that are domineering, that are controlling, that they are forceful. And when you don't wanna do what they say you must do, then they try to force you. 
It is a shame that that exists. Instead of lording it over people, there should be example setting that leaders are setting good examples for people to follow by their very lives and the way in which they live. Listen to the statement. Leaders should be examples, not dictators. Do you agree? It's sad that some leaders say, well, do as I say, not as I do. They're effectively saying that yeah, my life's actually such a bad example that don't even follow me because it's a bad example. That's not right. I think of the Apostle Paul. He wasn't two-faced in the way in which he lived. He was quite happy for people to follow the example of his life. In fact, he said, follow me as I follow Christ. And a leader who is not prepared to say, follow the example of my life, is probably doing something that is wrong. Because a true leader like Paul, he said, follow me as I follow Christ. This makes me realize that there's a wonderful reward for faithful shepherds, faithful life group leaders, faithful leaders in the church. And it is a crown of glory that will never fade away. This makes me realize in the end of the day, it is all gonna be worth it. Our faithful service to the Lord is all gonna be worth it. Come on, you can get a bit more excited than that. It's all gonna be worth it. <laughs> Woo! Praise the Lord. Verse, uh, point number two. Submission and humility help the body function effectively. Please say that with me. Submission and humility help the body function effectively. Look at verse five and verse six. Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. I like this. There's like a submission across the whole body. We submit to one another. Yes, there's a recognition of elders and so on, but also we are submitting to one another. And be clothed with humility, for God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Verse six, this is interesting. Therefore, humble yourselves. What's that word after humble? Yourselves. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. You've heard me say this before, but it is our job to humble ourselves. It is God's job to exalt us, and that's the way it should be. But if you think you're gonna start doing God's job to exalt you, and you're gonna start to exalt yourself, then God's gonna start doing your job, and he's gonna humble you. Ouch. So my hot tip for the day is just humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. Come on, tell somebody next to you, humble yourself. It's better that way. <laughs> In chapter three, two chapters earlier, we're dealing with chapter five. In chapter three, Peter had spoken extensively about submission in the family unit in the home. But now we see that Peter is talking about submission in the local church, and he's effectively telling us these are the things that need to be in place for the local church to function effectively. What is needing to be in place? It's a certain attitude where there is submission. It's a certain attitude where there is humility. Just imagine a congregation where every single member has a heart of humility before the Lord. Imagine a congregation where every single member has a submission to one another and esteems others better than themselves. That's what the Bible says. It's sad for me when we see so many church splits taking place. I met with a pastor during the week, first time I've ever met him. He runs a church in the south of the city and he came and met with me. He's been leading this church since about 2008. And uh, he said to me that they have already been through two church splits. I felt very sorry for him. And I believe that if we will apply this kind of thing of submission and humility in this attitude, there will be far less of that nonsense taking place because there's a humble attitude towards others. There's a regard for others, amen? 
Now, point number three. Are you still with me, church? Please eyeball the person next to you and check that both eyes are wide open. Fantastic. Pristi yara. Like they say in the Archies, Pristi yara. Now, I'm in. Point number three, casting your cares. Say this out loud with me. Casting your cares. Verse seven. Casting all your care upon him. For he cares. Say the word cares. He cares for you. I want to tell you, this is a potent verse. I say, praise God that this verse is in the Bible. Are you grateful for this verse? And we sure need this verse, especially in today's stressful world in which we are living. When we think of all that we've been through in these last two years, and there's been many very big challenges. We have this lifeline, we have this opportunity to be giving over things to the Lord and not carrying them in our own strength. It's a wonderful invitation from God. Now, the Greek word translated care is merimna. What does merimna mean? Merimna means concern, anxiety, worry. So, we need to be casting our concerns, our anxieties, and our worries over to the Lord. But Marimna also strongly conveys the idea of distraction. Please say distraction. distraction. Have you been feeling distracted lately? And you even struggle to focus. You sit down to focus and to get to things, and you are so distracted in your life. And so maybe you can relate to this and you can say, yeah, that's what it is. It's not so much fears and anxieties. It's just endless amount of distractions. And I want to say the Lord wants you to surrender those distractions to him, but it takes a part from you where you have to surrender those distractions. But it's to me so beautiful. Yeah, Peter is reminding us as believers that we can give our troubles to God. Yes, he is interested in us giving our troubles. And also, he's reminding believers that God truly cares. Can you hear those three words today? God truly cares. Have you ever cried out to God in frustration and said, God, do you even care what I'm going through? I'm sure many of us have, if not most of us, we get to that point, we frustrate it. There's been this after that, after that, after that. And we say, God, do you really care? And I wanna say, the truth is, he absolutely does, and he says it in his word in verse seven, for he cares for you. Hallelujah for that. Please tell the person next to you, God really cares for you. Tell them that. God really cares for you. And verse seven in the Amplified says the following. It kind of expands on a bit. It says, casting all your cares, and then in brackets it says, all your anxieties, all your worries, all your concerns once and for all on him, for he cares about you. Now, I love this place, this part. He cares about you with deepest affection. Would you just believe God's word? He cares with deep affection affection, and watches over you very carefully. You are the sheep of his pasture. He's watching over you now. In this week when you were so stressed out with that thing that happened on Tuesday, he's watching over you with affection. He's watching over you with great care, but also realize that it takes humility to recognize that we need his care. It takes humility to realize that we need God's help because if you're not gonna humble your heart, God says, I will oppose the proud. But God says, if you will humble your heart and choose to have an attitude of dependence on me, then the grace will flow. He resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. He gives grace to the contrite of heart. He gives grace to the those who are, have a broken spirit. 
And so if you want to receive God's grace, I have to tell you today that it comes with the low door of humility, recognizing that I cannot be self-reliant. I'm not strong enough to live on top by my own guts and personality and mindset and so on. It takes the Father in heaven and I am a sheep and I humble myself and I say, God, I receive your loving care. That's what you need to do today, church. God, I receive your loving care humbly coming before you because I trust that you really do care, amen? Point number four, this is my last point. Be vigilant and ready to resist the devil. Say this out aloud with me, here we go. Be vigilant and ready to resist the devil. This is actually how we need to live our lives. Now, look at verse eight and nine. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, say that with me, resist him. Steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. I would just like to point out that this says here that the devil walks around like a lion. He walks around like a lion, but he is not a lion. He is always trying to copy the real thing, but he will never be able to succeed. Because I wanna say this loud and clear, that there is only one true lion, and that is the lion of the tribe of Judah. It is our God. Come on, put your hands together. There's only one true lion. And when that lion roars, mountains tremble before him. The earth shakes before him. Don't be afraid of the counterfeit, the illegitimate, but let there be a fear for the true lion of the tribe of Judah. Now, I found something interesting because as you look at verse eight and nine, I see that Peter has grown. He has grown to be a more sort of like brave person. He's grown to be a more resolute and determined person. May I remind you, 30 years earlier, Peter was denying Jesus on three occasions. But since then, he had now grown and he had learned to stand firm against persecution and to stand firm against the attack of the enemy. And now he's urging you and I as believers that you and I can also stand firm against the enemy. I really pray that faith will arise in your hearts today, that you can stand firm against the enemy. I really pray that. What's also interesting for me is know this, that you can certainly grow in your ability to withstand the enemy. Now, isn't that good to know? Peter, at one point in time, he wasn't so good at resisting, but later on, you see this guy, he knows how to clop the devil, absolutely. Clop is Greek word for speedily extend your arm and slap. <laughs> He's learned some stuff. You might have been only serving the Lord for three or six months. And maybe you haven't grown that much yet in your ability to resist the devil. You can still resist him now. Let me tell you, be clear about that. But as you grow in your understanding of the Lord and understanding of who you are in Christ, you get a little bit more annoyed with the devil and you say, devil, get behind me, you silly old stinking thing in Jesus' name. Amen. I remember there was a pastor and he told the story that he woke up one night and there was a sense of an evil presence in his home and he walked into his lounge and he saw the devil was sitting on a chair there and the devil was now trying to make him fearful and intimidate him. And he took one look at this, I don't know if it was Smith or Wigglesworth or something like that, was it Wigglesworth? And he took one look at the devil and he said, oh, it's only you, I'm going back to bed. <laughs> Why? Because he had learned that you can withstand the devil. Child of God, you can withstand the devil. You've gotta know that. And this aspect of being vigilant, everybody say the word vigilant, is interesting. What does vigilant mean? The definition, keeping careful watch for possible danger. When you're vigilant, you're watching out for possible danger and you're ready to respond. The best way for you to withstand the enemy is for you to be strong in your faith. Now, what I mean by that? 
I mean that you believe that Jesus has already defeated the devil and that he has given you authority over the enemy and then you act in accordance with that. That is being strong in your faith. And Jesus said in Luke 10, verse 19, he said, Behold, I give you authority over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. You have to know that he who is in you is greater. I pray that the Spirit of God stirs that within you. He who is in you is greater. The authority has been given to you. You cannot fight off the devil in your own strength. But in the authority of God, you defeat him. Also, just to say that one thing's for sure, the devil has no good intentions for your life whatsoever. All he wants to do is devour and destroy you. You think you're gonna mess around with the occult and it's gonna be good and some nice things will happen. Rubbish, it will not happen like that you'll begin to open your life up to destruction and devouring and death. Don't play with the devil. He only has bad plans for you. And he comes and he'll try to tell you lies and he'll try to tell you, you know what? You want him to do that in your life, but you won't succeed. He'll tell you, you don't have the talent. Others have the talent, you don't have the talent. He'll say, you are gonna fail. But that's a lie. Don't accept that. Resist the devil when he comes with his lies. Let me give you another example. This is very important. The devil will come and tell you, he will say, life is not worth living. He'll say to you, you're actually a burden to all the people around you. And this is one of the main lies he uses. He said, he'll say, your family will be better off without you. Don't believe the lie. Let there be a vigilance in your heart that rises up and you resist the devil. And this is what it says in James 4, verse seven. It says, submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and this is what my Bible says, and he will flee from you. Say that with me. He will flee from you. A little louder. He will flee from you. Can we believe God and take him according to his word? He will flee from you. Let faith stir in your heart. 